Hello, listeners. Before we get to this week's episode, a quick programming note. On April 25th, the FDA announced it had granted accelerated approval to Tofersin, a treatment for people with ALS tied to mutations in the SOD1 gene. This is a significant victory for the ALS community and our efforts to make ALS livable for everyone everywhere until we can cure it. We will have much more to say about the approval of Tofersin in next week's episode. In the meantime, let's get to the show. Some of them actually thought that my work was BS. This was when it first came out, and they didn't believe it, but now they're working on it. That shows this is one of the aspects of ALS that they can not follow and examine. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Connecting ALS. I am your host, Jeremy Holden. Every year, the Sheila Essie Award for ALS Research is given to acknowledge and honor an individual who is making significant contributions to research. The award recognizes seminal research breakthroughs in the search for the cause, prevention, and cure for ALS. Past recipients have used the funds to continue ALS research or to support promising young scientists on their research teams. Since 1996, the ALS Association and the American Academy of Neurology have jointly chosen recipients of the award. The award is made possible through the generosity of the SE Family Fund through the ALS Association Golden West Chapter. The award is in memory of Sheila Essie, who battled ALS for 10 years and died from the disease in 2004. Richard Essie, Sheila's husband, served as a national trustee of the ALS Association and is one of the founders of the Greater Bay Area Chapter, now the Golden West Chapter. The ALS Association and the AAN are deeply grateful for the unwavering commitment of the ESSI family in continuing to support this important honor. This year, the ESSI Prize was awarded to Dr. Virginia Lee. Dr. Lee is the John H. Ware III Endowed Professor in Alzheimer's Research at the University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine. She is also the Director for the Center of Neurodegenerative Disease Research and Co-Director of the Marion S. Ware Center for Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Program. I recently caught up with Dr. Lee to talk about her contributions to the field and her celebrated career. Dr. Lee, thanks so much for being with us this week on Connecting ALS. You're very welcome. Yes. Before we get into some of the nuts and bolts of your work, can you tell us a little bit about how you found your way into uh, neurological research generally and ALS uh, more specifically? Yeah, so this may take a few minutes. Sure. (laughs) So um, I actually, I have a very sort of uh, interesting background, I I guess. So I was born in China and after the Second World War, and then my family uh, made our way to to Guangzhou. And then eventually when the communists came, we went to Hong Kong. So in the early fifties, I was uh, in Hong Kong only even until 1962. Then my mother sent me to England to study piano, to study music at the Royal Academy of Music. Oh, wow. And then I, I went because I just couldn't wait to get out of Hong Kong. It was just a small place and, you know, so I just was very keen to travel. So I went to London and then after about a year or so, I realized that I don't really have any talent to be a pianist. So I decided to go into science because I was pretty good in science when, when I was in high school. And, you know, so I got my bachelor's degree. I got my master's degree in biochemistry. I didn't know what to do with myself. I said, well, if I get a job, I wouldn't be able to support myself and so well. And so maybe I should get my PhD. So I came to uh, UCSF, the University of California in San Francisco to do my PhD because my mother was living in LA and uh, permanently. And I thought that if I lived in San Francisco, it would be a best compromise for me to see her regularly and not have to live with her. Sure. So then I I did my PhD and then I still and wanted to travel. So I went back to Europe. I went to Holland and for one year to do neuroscience actually. And but I did Holland because the way of working is very different from us in the US. So then I decided to come back to the US to complete my postdoc. So I went to Children's Hospital in Boston. And so I did my postdoc learning how to do animal models. So for my PhD, I actually did a lot of biochemistry. Actually, that, those are important because I actually was taking tissues and grind them up and then do run biochemistry and to isolate proteins. So that was my PhD. So for my master's, for my postdoc, 
I wanted to learn about animal models. So I went and worked with Mike Shlansky and at, and at his hospital and to learn about animal models. And then I really, I had no mentorship whatsoever. So I didn't know what to do. And at that time I met my husband and he was a neuropathologist. And so I decided that Smith, Klein and Friend, that's what they call it at the time, tried to recruit me. And, and I, John actually was amenable to go from MTH in Boston to Philadelphia to Penn because we had a very good program in neuropathology. And so we got here and then, and then I worked at Smith Klein for a year, hated it. And then John Sposs, which was my boss eventually, and told me that if you get some grants, you have a job. And so this is important for people to hear because most of the time now that if you have, if you can get R01s, grants, then most places will give you soft appointment. And so I did, so I got two grants. So I was an assistant professor, but at the same time, I was worried that I wouldn't be able to make it. So I, just, I actually went and did a MBA at the same time at the Wharton School because they have a weekend Wharton School. So I did that and I did my science. And I realized that at that time, that if I could do both of them together, I should be able to make it in science. And so I, I decided to just go full time in science. And so basically at that time, it was in the late in the eighties. Okay. So we, we started working together, John and I, but I, nothing about neurodegenerative disease, the topic that we talking about. And so John taught me all the neuropathology that I know. And, and so I'm a biochemist. So with the neuropathology knowledge, then I can then go and isolate each of the protein. We actually decided that's something that we would do starting in the eighties to systematically give a molecular phase to all the pathology that you see in all of neurodegenerative diseases, starting with tangles. And so the segue in the tangles was easy because I was working on neurofilament and people thought that tangles at the time in the eighties were comprised of neurofilament. And I knew that it was not. So I actually went and proved that it's tau. And so it was 1991. And then we decided to go after the protein in Lewy body in Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy body. So we ID of synuclein and as the protein. And then finally we realized that there is this chunk of disease like with FTD and ALS and they, we just didn't know what the protein was, they were ubiquinated. And so eventually I was able to show that it's a protein called TDB43. And I suspect that, no, I suspect, I know that TDB43 made the biggest impact because it was something that nobody knew. So it really opened up an entire field altogether. And so I just kept working on animal models and doing and human pathology, doing human pathology is really very important. And people don't recognize you know, the significance of it. And also, often they have no access to them. And I was very lucky because I was married to a neuropathologist whose job is really to do diagnosis of these neurodegenerative diseases as well as other diseases as well. And so I can get my hands on brains. And in fact, what John did was to develop a brain bank and which other people can request brain tissue from our brain bank. So it's actually web-based and you can go into the web, you can search for patients with a mental with Lewy body, for example, and then you can even say that early onset or and duration of disease and all of that, and the information would pop up. So it's really very useful. And so that's how I got started, how I did all the work and why that it had the successful, particularly with the human and aspect of it because of my relationship with my late husband, John Trichinowski. You mentioned the importance of grants in, in, in your world, in the world yeah. of research and academia. You received, or your leading team of researchers received a, a grant from the ALS Association's Barnett Drug Development Program. Right. What can you tell us about that research, about microglia and the novel therapeutic that you're looking into? So that, that grant was actually submitted by a former postdoc, and for, she actually was from Australia. And so basically she, so we did a study before she joined us and, and basically looked at all the genes that are changing in our animal model of ALS. And so there are these, you basically do transcriptomic analysis, and then you have a bunch of genes and then they're either go up or go down. Then you say, okay, and which one do I think? it's more important. So she went for this gene called Axel 
And so she applied to ALS Foundation. She got the grant. Unfortunately, she was not physically very well. So she basically started the project and she was not able to, the project is actually still ongoing until spring of next year. So I have another person who's a a junior faculty and Sylvia Porter, and she's taken over uh, that responsibility. So the study had already initiated. So what Sylvia is doing is trying to and complete the study. And I don't think that we know the answer yet, because I think that a lot of this time, it's just you do a time course and you wait until there's some phenotype. We know that because we know that these two groups are different, but we just haven't know the scope of it. So I think that most likely by next year and spring of next year, we'll have a conclusion to study. Then we'll see how important Excel is in terms of being a target and for ALS. Yeah, we'll look forward to the results of that research and hopefully have you back on to walk us through what we learn. Thinking about what we've learned uh, over the course of your time research and looking into ALS beyond uh, an understanding of TDP43, how has the field changed over the course of your career? I think that it's actually ALS is particularly interesting compared to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And the reason being is that people are desperate. ALS is a bad disease. It's really, it's the worst disease, and particularly for people who who don't have the disease, they see people with the disease. So basically, it's obvious, right? I think that if you have Parkinson's, it's just shuffled a little bit. And with Alzheimer's, as long as you don't open up your mouth and ask a question, people don't know that you're demented. But with ALS, it's just so obvious because you have such physical impairment. And people just can look at you and they feel so bad for you. And so because of that aspect of it, the trial have the same tone in the sense that the urgency, okay? And particularly these people don't live very long. So a lot of of physicians basically said, okay, he has a new drug. We just give it to so-and-so. So basically it's not out of hand, but I think that if we don't watch out, it would be out of hand. And because these patients have gone through many different drugs but there's just nothing there. And they go on the drug for a year or half a year or whatever, and they die. And they eat, and maybe, I don't even know whether there's any kind of benefit to some of these drugs that are being used right now for treatment of ALS, whether they, for example, delay the onset a little bit or, and so that the impairment is not as bad. And I don't know whether there are a lot of information on that either. Are you hopeful that we're, that the field is on the right track, that we've made progress in terms of understanding the disease and identifying targets for potential treatments? Have you seen that the community is moving in the right direction? I think it, it's just slowly encompassing everything. So for example, a few years ago, one of the major hypotheses for ALS is non-cell economies and mechanisms. In other words, that it's the, even though the neurons are the ones that are dying, but it's not them that are causing the disease. It's actually something else. So I think that some investigators believe that glial cells may be important. And but I think that turned out to be one of the maybe one of the, the mechanisms, but not definitely not the only one. So there are just multiple ways in which people are looking at the disease. And I think that the glial cells would be important and studying the pathology within the neurons is important because if you don't have the pathology, and then the neuron will die. At least for neurodegenerative diseases, we always were able to demonstrate that there's the disease onset is heralded by the presence of the pathology. And then when the pathology got bad, then the cells die. And when the cells die, you have loss of function. And so depending on where the neurons are, so you get movement disorder or you could, you get dementing illness depending on where the cell loss is. If it's in the hippocampus, then you lose your memory. If it's the motor neuron and you can't walk. Later this month, the uh, AAN is going to be honoring you with the Sheila Essie Award for ALS Research. Congratulations on that great achievement. What does it mean to, to to be honored in this way? I'm obviously very pleased because I think that it's always good to be recognized for the work that you've done. And so I, I think that TDP 43 is an important finding for the field of ALS and because we actually, we discovered that in 2006, I believe. And so it's been like 15 years, or more, 16, 17 years. It's just really a lot of activity. 
And so the ALS field, as I mentioned, that is there's a lot of personality in the field. And some of them actually thought that my work was BS. This was when it first came out and they didn't believe it. And but now they're working on it. So that shows that that they realized that this is one of the aspects of ALS that they can not follow and, and examine that because it contributes to the disease as well. You mentioned that we're 15 years removed from the discovery of TDP43 and then 15 years into our understanding of how it works and its role in disease onset and progression. What would you like to see in the next 15 years in, in the field of ALS research? Yeah, and let's, so I want to go back one step sure. to tell you that ALS is unique in the sense that an FTLD, TDP2, they're unique in the sense that they have TDP403 as the pathological protein. And while, you know, it, and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and those proteins are tau and alpha-synuclein, they're actually, even though they're very abundant, they're brain-specific, more or less brain-specific protein. They're very abundant. And yet, they're not so important for the survival of the animal. Because if you knock it out, well, knock that tail, knock that synuclein, the animal, their life, they don't care. They may not have the same and lifespan, but they're fine. But TDP is an RNA binding protein. It's got a very important function. It regulates RNA. And so because of that, you knock it out, you have a dead mouse. You overexpress, you have a dead mouse. So it's much more difficult to work with for TDP. And, but the thing is that a lot of very smart people the same people that I say that they sometimes are missing the boat, but they're also very smart and they're now on the right track. So there's more people working on it. That's really the key is that if you have really a lot of bright people working on a problem at some point, okay, and something will show up. And if you ask me, I know that the resident is trying to understand and how TDP4 is for cause of disease, but it may be hard to do and how to come up with a drug that will counteract the effect of TDP. That may be hard too. But now I think that some of the investigators are looking downstream. So they basically, they manipulate TDP. They actually show that these set of genes change if you change the level of TDP. So those now becoming targets. So if we built the pathway that are mediated by TDP, your work is focused on animal models, a critical part in, in, in drug development and in, in, re in scientific research. In human, I think that the, the understanding what, what went wrong in the human brain is very important. I want you to communicate that. And to be able to study the human brain, most importantly, to try, from clinical perspective and also from the pathology and so on. Because once you know what goes wrong, at least you can re recapitulate the pathology. Or if all ALS patients have the same pathology, so the pathology become important. Sure. So somebody has to study that. So that's basically and what we go by. And yes, they were these other people. They didn't think that TDP was so important. They thought that that other proteins were more important. That's right. So they actually identify etexin two, something downstream from TDP is something important. And so they actually did a lot of work on etexin two, which basically works. And would some, in, but they may, uh, we don't know, it's still a bit too early whether or not etexin will be, if they can provide etexin or modulate it so that they will be normal, whether or not the patient will all be normal. We don't know that. But I think all of those are being done right now. They need to go downstream. And instead of doing TDP, whichever downstream that is important, they can focus on that as well. That's, that would be a logical next step for the next 15 years. I was going to ask, we talk about the upstream and downstream when we're thinking about the kind of biological pathways of disease. And I was going to ask about the importance of focusing on all aspects of the stream, looking at downstream impacts, but also looking at upstream. Yeah, so we like to do that. So I think that to particularly for upstream, you more or less have to go the genetic route because you don't know who's going to get ALS. And but if there's a if particularly if they have a mutation and on a gene there's autosomal dominant inherited and so you will get the disease so if you have a mutation that gene you'll get the disease so that you can go upstream you can say okay these people will get the disease how do we 
slow it down so that they can get the disease later or not at all. You know, so we're not quite there yet, but I think that people are definitely working on that aspect as well. And as you said, very bright people working on all those aspects. The last question I have for you, Dr. Lee, is do you still play the piano? No, actually, it's very sad. I just didn't have time. And now I had I have a little bit more time. My fingers don't work as well. I have a little bit of a paritis. And in fact, and this is, at the end, it's not so bad. So I have this wonderful baby grand Steinway in my living room, and which was not played much at all. And I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't sell it back to Steinway. And they don't, they said that now, you know, that just maybe your audience would be interested. Now people don't like the little girls and boys to pay piano as much as they used to. So there's a lot of secondhand piano in Steinway. He said that he has a thousand of them that he didn't know what to do. Oh, so wow. he would give me less than what I pay for, much less than what I pay for, and to buy the piano back. So finally, I'm moving from my house right now. So I'm living in a three-story townhouse, but I'm moving to a one level because I'm getting to the age in the next 20 years, I would be I, should, I want to be able to move around, not have to be limited by the stairs. And so at the place where I'm moving into, and they actually want to take the piano and put it in the lobby. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so, there, so right so now be there's there. a big black bird there. And so the manager of the building, when I told her about the piano, I thought she could put it in the recreation room or whatever. And she said, no, we're going to put it downstairs in the main entrance. Yeah, wow, that's great. Great. That's a nice little bow tie on the end yeah. of that story. Yeah. Well, Dr. Lee, thanks so much for your time and sharing your insights with us today. You're very welcome. I want to thank my guest this week, Dr. Virginia Lee. If you like this episode, maybe go back and check out our conversation with the 2022 Essie Prize winner, Dr. Matthew Kiernan. Also, share this episode with a friend. And while you're at it, please rate and review Connecting ALS wherever you listen to podcasts. It's a great way for us to connect with more listeners. Our production partner for this series is Citizen Racecar. Post-production by Alex Brower. Production management by Gabriella Montekin. Supervised by David Hoffman. That's going to do it for this week. Thanks for tuning in. We'll connect with you again soon. Bye.